for that welcome to country. It is always hard to follow, but uh, welcome uh, to all to the inaugural Rizina at Sydney. Uh, I'm Justin Bassey, the Executive Director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge a number of dignitaries uh, here today. Uh, our two, two keynote speakers, India's External Affairs Minister, Dr Jai Shankar, and Australia's Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Chris Bowen. Indian High Commissioner, Manpreet Boira, French Ambassador, Jean-Pierre Thibault. Other diplomats, including the Deputy Heads of Mission of Indonesia, Japan and India. Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Secretary, Jan Adams. And to her team, thank you very much for your support. Former Secretary, Peter Varghese, other senior Indian Ministry of External Affairs officials, and of course, the senior Australian government officials. The first Rosina in Australia demonstrates how far the relationship between our two countries has come in recent years. Not only does it bring together our two leading think tanks, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and the Observer Research Foundation, it also signals the extent to which Australia and India increasingly stand for many of the same ideals, a free and open region, economic prosperity and a rules-based order. Australia and India have recognised that our strategic interests are converging, but we've also recognised that an alignment of interest doesn't by itself make closer cooperation inevitable. Rather, it has taken a determined effort to strengthen our partnerships across economic, foreign and defence policy by grasping shared opportunities and meeting challenges together. Many people in this room have contributed to that effort and no one has done more than Dr Jai Shankar himself. We've seen the bilateral relationship prosper and we've seen the Quad re-emerge, reaching foreign minister level in 2019 and then leader level in 2021. The Quad leaders meeting to be held in Australia this year will continue to reinforce the significance of the, of the relationship for each of our countries and our entire region. Today's event is a curtain raiser for the Rosina Dialogue, which will be held next month in Delhi. Having commenced in 2016, Rosina has quickly become the region's premier conference on geopolitics and geoeconomics. So it is with pride that we've brought it to Australia. It is also a prelude to Aspie's Sydney Dialogue, which while a little more youthful than Rosina, is building reputation as the foremost international forum on critical and emerging technologies. While the phrase think tanks conveys an image of deep thoughts of abstract theory, ASPE and ORF coming together for Rosina at Sydney shows that think tanks like ours are increasingly aware that thinking without doing and idealism without pragmatism is ineffective in our era of intense competition. It reflects that our regional and global challenges require not just theory, but strategy that can be practically implemented. At ASPE, we have proudly established an India program with critical support from DFAT and others, with the key being practical engagement with India at government, industry and civil society levels to further strengthen our ties. With India as G20 president this year, it is vital to both our nation's interests that we work together to advance a region where countries are sovereign and resilient, with a strategic balance that deters aggression and coercion and encourages cooperation. The Australia-India relationship shows that differences can be managed through dialogue, that hesitations of history can be overcome if there is sufficient trust between our political systems, and that practical cooperation can deliver real benefits to our nations and our region. Intimate dialogue, increased trust, and practical collaboration sums up the India-Australia partnership today. The long-standing view of Australia as a middle power and India as a developing one has transitioned into Australia as a regional power and India as the next superpower, with particular potential in advanced technologies that will be vital both for strategic balance and global influence. Whether we are responding to global events like the COVID-19 pandemic, working together on climate and energy security policies, identifying ways to enhance our economic security, protecting ourselves from national security implications of critical technologies, or countering interference in our democratic institutions and sovereignty, the Australia-India relationship is now more important than ever for ourselves and the region. Rosina at Sydney is a forum to tackle all of these challenges, 
and to discuss how we can substantively respond as part of the next chapter in this increasingly entwined and aligned relationship. I thank Minister Jaishankar for working with ORF and ASPE and having the ambition to make this special event happen. I also thank the Australian Government for its support and specifically Minister Bowen, whose participation shows the breadth of the bilateral relationship across the spectrum of international and national security issues, including climate and energy. And speaking of energy, I am grateful to Dr. Samir Saran and in awe of his indefatigable character. And I thank all of you for coming to tur turbocharge the relationship for the stability and prosperity of the region. I would like to express my thanks to those who have traveled from both interstate and abroad, particularly of course from India, but also other countries, including Singapore and the United States, a truly Indo-Pacific conference. With that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Minister Jaishankar to open the dialogue. Minister Jaishankar has been India's external affairs minister since 2019, and before that, he played an instrumental role in Indian foreign policy as foreign secretary and numerous ambassadorships, including to the US and China. He is truly a giant of international relations and one of the most influential foreign ministers in the world today. Minister, please do us the pleasure of opening the inaugural Rosina at Sydney. Very good afternoon to all of you, Justin, Samir, Minister, colleagues and friends. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And uh, I think as Justin pointed out, uh, this is an occasion for the Raisina Dialogue to step beyond the shores of India. And uh, in the room today, I think there could be a few others, but I think Samir and I could claim to be present at the inception of Raisina Dialogue. It's a little bit like watching your kid go out of the country uh, and you know, you, you have a interest, you have a sense of pride. Uh, and uh, uh, really thank you very much uh, for partnering uh, us uh, in this enterprise. And I hope in the coming years that this would become uh, the premier India-Australian forum uh, where we can discuss issues of common interest. Now, we all, uh, you know, you spoke about it as a curtain raiser. Uh, and uh, so in a sense, I'd like to share with uh, all of you some of the issues which would happen uh, at the beginning of next month in Delhi. Uh, let me first say that uh, at this time, it's important we all appreciate uh, that the larger outlook uh, as we see the world is one of great uncertainty, uh, a lot of unpredictability, new players, new behavior. And by the way, I'm talking about the Delhi test between India and Australia. Now, <laughs> uh, this applies to some degree, to actually to the world uh, scenario as well. And uh, if we put together really the, uh, the cumulative impact of three years of COVID, the damage that it has done to the global socioeconomic fabric, the year of the Ukraine conflict, the knock-on effects, the fuel, food, fertilizer, trade disruptions, the shortages it has created, the uncertainties it has enhanced. And then take some of the perennial challenges which pre-existed, uh, climate. Now, climate was a growing concern. Uh, I think in the last few years, what we thought what the future uh, portended has actually happened to us. So we are witnessing uh, climate events on an increasingly uh, larger, more catastrophic scale. Uh, and in fact, today in any global risk assessment, uh, I would say building in a climate uh, calculation uh, is very much uh, a part of that. 
And, uh, uh, you know, there are the other concerns, concerns about terrorism, concerns about maritime security. Uh, there are also growing concerns about uh, financial sustainability. Uh, I think uh, there are more than 70 countries who have or are engaging the IMF uh, in terms of stabilizing their, uh, their national finances. Uh, and uh, unlike in the near past, uh, many of these are not low-income countries. Some of them are middle-income countries. So uh, I think even, a, uh, even, a, even an optimistic view of the world would be reasonably pessimistic at this point of time. My second point, flowing from that, if there is today uh, really an urgent collective task it is how to de-risk the global economy. Uh, and part of that uh, is, you know, exactly the events that I have referred to, uh, over-dependence on manufacturing, over-dependence on energy, uh, over-dependence on services. So how do we create more reliable and resilient supply chains? In a more digital world, how do, we, uh, how do we ensure at least the minimal trust and transparency? Uh, because the fact is that uh, we cannot be agnostic about data in the manner in which we were mistakenly agnostic about products. You know, where my data resides, who processes it, what do they do with it, how do they extrapolate it, matters deeply to me. So uh, for us to pretend that all nations are the same uh, and it's none of our business what happens uh, inside, I think that era is now uh, behind us and we must not just accept it, we must actually be aware of it and make plans to, to deal with this. And in fact, uh, Minister Bhavan and I were just discussing, this applies as well to green technologies. You know. We should not end up in a, in a world where our desire to be greener leads us to be more dependent on a few and therefore more insecure. So how do we decentralize? How do we collaborate? How do we diversify? Uh, in a sense, how do we democratize the world? Democratize it technologically, democratize it economically. I think this is, uh, I would say, the... Uh, the second point which I would flag for your attention. Now, if I were to pick three words to, to uh, uh, put before you the state of our contemporary world, uh, those three words for me would be number one, globalization. Uh, because globalization has worked, it's had its problems, it's had its downsides, but it's had actually an enormous impact, both the pluses and minuses on global society. Globalization actually has helped to create a rebalancing. Uh, uh, you spoke, Justin, about our G20 presidency. G20 itself is proof of that rebalancing, that till 2008, uh, the global leadership such as it was, uh, uh, was seen as G7. Uh, and the fact was that the events of 2008, 2009 demonstrated that G7 was too narrow. So uh, I, I use G20, but I would not stop at G20. I, I use that as a metaphor to, to underline the point that if you look today at the production and consumption centers of the world, uh, they are vastly different certainly from what they were in 1945, but I would say almost every decade, it's very useful to actually see a decadal chart of who's up and who's down and how the balances uh, are shifting there. And flowing from that rebalancing, that rebalancing today is, and I use the word present continuous here, uh, is actually creating uh, an emerging multipolarity uh, that there will still, I mean, the United States, to my mind, has been the premier power in the foreseeable future. I still see it as the premier, uh, premier power. 
Uh, and clearly, the rise of China, the share of China in global economy, in global technology, in global influence, these are undeniable factors. But the fact is that uh, in the, let us say, let's take this decade, you're clearly going to see many more powers who will have more influence on global debates and global outcomes uh, than they did before. And to my mind, certainly some of them would be uh, sufficiently separated from the rest of the herd to be seen as a pole, and therefore you will have uh, multipolarity. Uh, since Brexit, uh, there's obviously been a very intense global debate about gl uh, globalization, uh, and uh, President Trump's election uh, sort of intensified that debate, if I can put it that way. But to my mind, you know, it's not an issue of is globalization good or bad? You can't turn it back. It's there for real. It's hardwired into our existence. The issue is really what's the right model of globalization? That is it a model which is fairer, uh, which is uh, fairer within societies, fairer between societies? Is it a model where the benefits exceed the vulnerabilities because that is today also a very important downside of globalization. So I think that's, to my mind, actually a key global debate. So one is de-risking the global economy, but the second really is uh, the, the model, the preferred direction of globalization that a lot of countries want to see. Now, in a changing world, obviously there will be new conversations. Uh, and uh, among the conversations we are seeing uh, is the, uh, are those of uh, the importance of values, uh, of uh, beliefs, of ideologies, uh, not just uh, in, a, in a very antiseptic way of interest. And there is a whole debate which flows out of that, you know. Uh, one debate, of course, is that of democratic countries, pluralistic societies, and those who are not. But there's another debate, and it's a debate within the democratic world, which is really whose democracy, whose values, whose definition, whose norms. Because here, too, the, the, the transformation of the world, the rebalancing, a lot of it derives from an era of, I would say, a G7 dominance, a very... Euro-Atlantic view uh, of what is democracy. Now, the fact, if I can put it somewhat immodestly, uh, the fact that democracy is perceived as a global uh, aspiration is actually because India chose to be a democracy at the time of its independence. And because the first country which was decolonizing, and it happened to be the largest country which was decolonizing, chose a difficult democratic path. And then, despite decades of adversity and limited resources, stuck to that path. And stuck to that path when actually other democracies questioned the viability of that path. Uh, that today is very much, uh, I think, uh, uh, at the center of a debate and a conversation that we must have uh, on democracy. That uh, there are uh, practices and beliefs and cultures which are relevant to how democracy is actually uh, executed and, and uh, improved. Uh, my next point, of course, is the welfare of the world. Uh, and uh, here again, uh, the fact that uh, the capacities of some countries are not what they used to be is a very relevant factor. Uh, I particularly refer here to the United States. Uh, for me, the big change in the last decade is not that the US capacities are relatively uh, less than what they used to be. It is that the US is actually getting into a mindset where it's aware of that limitation and is open to working with like-minded partners to address it. And like-minded partners include countries who are not treaty allies. Now, in Australia, 
it's not a change you will readily realize because you are a treaty ally. For you, working with the United States is not anything new. It's part of your history for the last eight years. For us, it is. So, and it's, you know, certainly I, I would, uh, I would uh, emphasize that uh, there have been big changes in our foreign policy. But I would equally stress that there's been a big change in American thinking, that this is not the same United States with which we dealt with in the 60s or 80s or even, frankly, in 2005. Uh, that there is an evolution out there. And that evolution today, you can see on a whole range uh, of issues. Uh, and as a result, we actually today have new strategic concepts, new theater, geopolitical theaters, if you would, new mechanisms, and obviously the most notable of these uh, in terms of, uh, of, on a conceptual level, is the Indo-Pacific. At a mechanism level is the Quad. Uh, and uh, the Quad to me is a very, very, uh, you know, it's an enterprise laden with a lot of significance. Because if you look at it, there's that Indo-Pacific space. Four countries, uh, not geographically contiguous at all, with an enormous amount of sea space and some land space between them, but who have in different ways overcome their own uh, past uh, outlook to forge something common in response to a perceived global and regional need. And uh, it's, a, it's an endeavor with which I happen perhaps to be associated most, more closely than most others. Uh, I'm still probably the only witness in office of the first effort in 2007. Uh, and uh, I've seen it at various levels from a, you know, doing it as a permanent secretary to a foreign minister, and now we're seeing it as a summit level, and Australia will be hosting the summit soon. Uh, so it is, to my mind, uh, uh, a development of great consequence. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, not just us, I look at the foreign policy of our other quad partners as well. I think today it has a salience which uh, very few would have predicted perhaps even two or three years ago. So finally, uh, let me end with a few thoughts uh, on, my, uh, on our G20 uh, presidency. Uh, it's obviously uh, an extraordinary opportunity. It's a great honor. Uh, it's a time when you have a certain convening power and an agenda shaping uh, opportunity. But it's also, as I said initially, a particularly difficult juncture of world politics. Uh, we were, you know, the way the G20 works, it works as a troika. Uh, so the incoming and the outgoing are associated with the current chair. So we, you know, we had some visibility, perhaps a little more than visibility, some role as well, a supportive role, uh, when our predecessor chair, Indonesia, uh, was holding that responsibility. So we know that last year was a real struggle, uh, that the Ukraine uh, conflict had uh, very uh, strongly polarized the G20. Uh, we, all of us, worked very hard to find some kind of common ground uh, on that issue. I believe that we did succeed finally at the Bali summit and I really think an enormous amount of credit is due to Indonesian uh, patience and creativity uh, in that regard. Uh, but today, the rest of the world expects the G20 to address its concerns. Because the rest of the world actually and the rest of the world is another about 180 countries. That they have real problems, pressing problems, deep concerns. And they think it is for the G20, as the top 20 economies of the world, to show the direction, to come up with answers, to at the very least be cognizant and if not sympathetic of their concerns. 
so our hope is that uh, we are able to uh, steer the g20 in the direction uh, in which it should go to uh, to uh, undertake the responsibilities the remit with which the g20 was originally tasked which was economic growth and global development and we are doing this not as a just as a uh, shall i say uh, feeling the the vibes from the rest of the world we actually did it as a as a practical empirical exercise uh, in the month of january uh, we actually consulted 123 countries uh, and consulted means at the level of prime minister himself and cabinet ministers we have a good sense today by asking the world literally asking the world saying here we are with this responsibility what is it which is uppermost in your mind what is it which is your most pressing concern uh, and what can we do about it so today i i just conclude by saying that i uh, had the pleasure of meeting the prime minister this morning uh, of spending time with my counterpart penny wong this afternoon uh, i think from what i can see the australian view uh, is very much aligned with the thinking which uh, i have put forward uh, for me uh, this relationship is exceptionally important and i can uh, only underline that by the frequency of my visits uh, that it is exceptionally important uh, uh, it would for us make a big difference uh, in the g20 uh, in the quad bilaterally and i think uh, regionally as well you know i'm coming here after spending 3 days in fiji so uh, do bear in mind uh, that the india that i represent today is also an india whose influence and interest and footprint is growing in the world uh, we feel we can be of uh, of uh, uh, utility and support in regions which may not be that proximate to us uh, so that too has been part of my conversations Uh, in australia so once again i i would uh, thank both asp and orf for providing me the opportunity to share some thoughts about our relationship about my visit but most important to show you the first trailer about what's going to happen in pressing our dialogue thank you very much